Janka, hello. Can you, do you have a hi. microphone? Hi, hi, how are you? Good morning for everyone. I'm from ESSRG from Hungary. We are a part of a project, Inspires, as Ishikaisha as well. And I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing some nice information about the participatory research. Excellent. Welcome, Janka. Anybody else wants to introduce Thomas Puja? No, I don't have a microphone today, but my name is Thomas Pagan. In okay. the chat. Some people are just writing also in the chat, which is also okay. So Oh yes, we have some transition. So Thomas says that he doesn't have a microphone and he introduces himself uh, and he's also in a European Union project called Towards a European Framework for Community Engagement in Higher Education, TIFC. And he looks forward to the webinar as well. Welcome, Thomas. Okay. Okay, so maybe Puja wants to introduce herself as well or, yes. or am I? On the, on the chat. In India. Okay, Puja is from India, working also on participatory research. And also looking forward to the conversation. Excellent, welcome. And Damaya, perhaps? Francesca? Okay, we can keep on through the chat because we are seeing that there are some still left and Maybe we want to start, so you can continue introducing yourself through the chat. We can now start the session, if you agree. <clears throat> well, first of all, hello. We are Josep Carreras and Rosina Malagrida. We both work in the Living Lab for Health, which is located in Irsi Casa, <clears throat> in Barcelona, in Spain. And we are members, partners of uh, the European project Inspires which has the main goal to build effective cooperation between science and society by supporting the growth of science shops and enabling the expansion of responsible participatory research and innovation in Europe and abroad in order to tackle, to better tackle the key societal challenges that affect our world today. Today we have with us, we are very pleased to have with us Dr. Rajesh Tandon he is founder president of the Society for Participatory Research in Asia, and he's also co-chair of the UNESCO Chair on Community-Based Research and Social Responsibility in Higher Education. He has authored more than a hundred articles, a dozen books, and numerous training manuals, and also, he, as he was explaining recently, he gives a lot of training at national and international level, and he has been given many awards and recognitions for his work in this field. Participatory research is a methodology that values experimental, experiential knowledge and practitioners' wisdom, in addition to the more formal knowledge available in academia, in order to bridge the gap between the world of practice and the world of research. He will present inspiring examples and recommendations to help to implement participatory research during 30 minutes, and then we will have 20 minutes to ask questions. Before uh, Rajesh's presentation, we wanted to just uh, highlight that, as you can see below the chat, this session is being recorded because we will upload it in the Inspire's website as well at the end. So some of the participants who at the end cannot make it can see the webinar uh, online whenever they want. And as Rosina said, if you want to comment anything, uh, you can also write down uh, in the chat. We will, after Rajesh's presentation, we will have uh, more or less 20 minutes for questions and answers. So maybe one easy way to facilitate this discussion is that you write down your questions after Rajesh's presentation in the chat so that we can uh, read it aloud. And if um, if it's something is not clear, we will 
just ask you if you want to to ask it uh, with your voice and with yeah with the mic. But for those do, uh, who don't have mic, you can use the chat as well. So after this short uh, introduction, uh, we give the floor to Rajesh, and we are waiting uh, to hear many many interesting initiatives from Priya. So Rajesh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all who joined the webinar. I have a group of young colleagues also sitting in this room, participating in this uh, conversation on participatory research. I want to start by <clears throat> acknowledging the variety of knowledge sources and knowledge cultures that exist in the world. Many of us who have been professionally trained as researchers in whatever discipline we are trained in tend to develop a domain expertise and in the process we tend to forget that people in our societies, communities, also possess their own knowledge and have tools for production, use, and storage of knowledge. So before we talk about participatory research, one of the fundamental starting points is to acknowledge multiple sources, multiple sites, multiple cultures of knowledge production and knowledge utilization. From the point of view of professionally trained researchers, therefore, let us look at where did the concept participatory research come from. As uh, the slide on historical roots indicates, uh, there are several sources of the concept and practice of participatory research in the past 50 years or so. One set of <laughs> practitioners who believed in transformative adult education, uh, and you can see some of their names, my UNESCO co-chair Dr. Budhall actually used the phrase participatory research for the first time in 1975. In their writings, Paulo Verde and Orlando Fasborda and Miles Horton in US talked about similar ideas but did not use the phrase. Their purpose was to use adult education and learning as a transformative force. Then there was a second group of people who were social change practitioners. Maria Lisa Swans and Yusuf Kassan were in Tanzania. Eileen Balamid was in Philippines. Francisco Vio Grossi was in Venezuela and Chile. And I was here in India. We came to participatory research because we were promoting social change in our communities with uh, indigenous people, with uh, farmers, with women's groups. And in the process of promoting that, we discovered that people have their own knowledge and they have been using it for advancing their own situations. The third source, which actually chronologically is an original earlier source, uh, is the concept of action research, which came during the Second World War Germany a person who first wrote that phrase in the early 40s, 1940s, was called Dr. Kurt Lewin, who later on moved to USA. And uh, in US, action research entered the field of management studies. So I first read about action research before I read about participatory research. And uh, interestingly enough, it also entered the social practice in Colombia. So Orlando Foss Borda was a student in US when these ideas were being floated around in the 
50s and therefore he brought action research to Colombia and Latin America and focused on this methodology for social transformation. So now over the past uh, four decades or so, there are three related but somewhat differently implying phrases. Participatory research, as I mentioned, Bud Hall and those of us who came from adult education and social change tradition. Participatory action research is the one, this name was given through an ILO UNRIS program where Orlando Fasborda was also very active professionally. So we associate participatory action research through that window. And then more recently, in uh, late 1980s and early 1990s, participatory rural appraisal, or in short, PRA, got popularized through the work of Dr. Robert Chambers in UK. And it is this domain, PRA, this methodology, this approach that entered international development. So while in Barcelona or in Europe, you may find all these very new PRA and PR in the development fraternity of the southern societies has been in use also in academia and in the world of practice for nearly three decades. Now, what is distinctive about participatory research? First of all, the purpose of research is to transform the relations of power. And that means by using knowledge, so knowledge is a source of power and control. And if those who are feeling powerless, they generate their own knowledge, they value their own knowledge, then they can change the relations of power. Knowledge production through this methodology involves awareness raising, conscientization, the concept that Paulo Freire used, and it also entails some amount of collectivization. So in a way, knowledge production itself is linked to social mobilization. Thirdly, and perhaps even more fundamentally, the approach believes that even without a PhD, ordinary people are capable of critical reflection and can use knowledge for their own benefit. This apparatus for knowledge production exists in every human being, even though only a few of us are certified users of it through our master's or PhD degrees. Valuing local knowledge, uh, local is different from practitioner and is different from indigenous. In uh, theory, you will find separation between this. Indigenous knowledge is associated with indigenous communities. And um, if you look at the, the, the environmental ecological knowledge that everybody is so fascinated by in the last 25 years, this resided in indigenous communities around the world, from uh, Amazon forests to eastern parts of India. Practitioner knowledge is the one which is generated through practice. So when you try to act in a reality, you learn about the reality in some ways. Um, so action-oriented approach to knowledge production includes practitioner knowledge. And obviously, the purpose of research is to generate some solution or some improvement in the lives of communities and some people. Um, let me move on. Uh, this is a standard uh, research cycle. You know, we all study it when we do research uh, courses. You, you frame research questions, then you design data collection method, then you do analysis and you have findings and then you share findings. Now what happens in participatory research? And I will first explain this and then take you through an example.
typically research questions are framed from the domain knowledge of the researchers they are interesting curiosity based intellectual challenges of questions increasingly uh, as research is getting funded by uh, governments and even private business they frame the research question in participatory research alternatively we try to co construct the research question with the community whose agenda research is supposed to serve now co construction as a phrase is now a very popular phrase around the world but framing of research questions in partnership with local community is quite rare most of the participatory research reports that you find is in the stage of designing data collection methods so this is where you see a lot of pra methods being used mapping etc etc at the third stage of analysis and findings again the use of participatory research perspective is rather limited because bulk of the analysis is done by trained researchers co facilitation of analysis is difficult and is not very popular in practice the last stage sharing findings is also very popular in using participatory research this is where a lot of rri methods on public engagement or science communication etc come in of course findings are also shared through conferences workshops and there are very many innovative methods of holding uh, shows uh, exhibitions as ways of sharing findings now let me take you through a quick uh, research uh, example this if necessary but i want to illustrate the example uh, the one which we have been working on recently is uh, the question of addressing the issue of maternal mortality and sex selective abortion in rural area of rajasthan and this is a, a you know where female male ratio is uh, less than 900 it's a serious challenge now a lot of research has been done on kind of services that pregnant mothers need and research has also been done in general around the questions of patriarchy and the favorite uh, son kind of a cultural practice in this region but those are a level of generalization that don't bring about local action or local change so we decided to engage with a large number of rural communities through a campaign mode where we wanted to work with them to improve maternal mortality rate and reduce sex selective abortion a campaign mode is essentially where you inform people about the issue from the point of view of raising awareness but in the process local communities separately women and separately men begin to talk about their experience on these issues from which you tend to frame some sort of a research question in a specific context the purpose of this was also in a way so that communities in, you know demand better health services and uh, maternal mortality rate declines and sex selective abortion reduces the responsibility for a lot of this work in this state of uh, india rests with what we call local government or panchayat and local governments are elected bodies many of them are headed by women and yet they do not necessarily prioritize maternal health and female feticide as part of their agenda so in this approach over a period of 9 to 12 months we work with multiple sites within this district and um, partnered with women 
their groups and local elected women representatives to explore why despite availability of services and despite awareness around female feticide agenda, in practice, people's behavior was not changing. And from this research, a number of practical issues emerge in terms of access, in terms of uh, location of service providers, in terms of uh, lack of understanding of men around these issues. And so the approach then was to find solutions to each of these causes in such a way that local women and their groups as well as locally elected women representatives in local bodies are able to become active agents for taking care of their own health and putting pressure on the public delivery system to become relevant and accountable. And one of the main outcomes of this was that women who were otherwise hesitant to participate in public um, meetings of the local bodies began to attend those meetings regularly and talk about their issues. In a way, it helped to build capacity of local actors to become agents in their own uh, well-being. As fellow researchers who were part of this process and we systematized this knowledge and we published materials which we took to uh, provincial level and national level uh, policy makers that these are the insights which are coming from the field and you may need to tweak and alter your policy and program guidelines. So let us look at under what context this methodology becomes relevant. Many a times people raise the question that participatory research tends to be limited in certain types of local settings. It is true that knowledge so generated is used locally, but it is possible to undertake participatory research at a scale as well. I'll give you an example where participatory research was used at a scale with 30,000 households in the city of Mumbai who were facing eviction because they were, uh, their houses were on a land that needed to be acquired by municipality for other development purposes. The municipality and its planners, first of all, did not even know how many people live on that piece of land. And secondly, they did not know what livelihood or what other activities they are involved in. So this community and some researchers who were concerned about their well-being came together and identified about 100 young boys and girls who had some degree of primary education. And they decided that in order to explain to the municipal authorities the scale of the problem, they needed to quickly collect data, some basic data, because people were not sure if the municipal authorities really understood the scale of the problem. And within a period of 10 days, these uh, 100 volunteers, young boys and girls, spanned around the whole area over these households and collected basic information about how many people in the household, how many elderly, how many kids, what livelihood options they have, etc., etc. And with the help of the researchers, it was compiled and they went to a to release the report to the press, to the media, and they went to the municipal uh, officials to present their findings. And then they did another clever thing. They invited uh, municipal officials to a celebration on their 
uh, land uh, just so that they get exposed to the realities and they 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 ask them to give awards to these uh, some of these volunteers uh, and these awards were called community researchers award now this is an example where not just 100 or 200 households but such a large number of households were involved and a quantitative process of survey was undertaken because this is the second issue that is raised in participatory research some people confuse it by saying oh it only uses qualitative data but that is not true you depending on the requirement of information you can collect uh, information through variety of methods of course certain methods are more usable by the community actors certain methods are more relevant to the topic that is at stake or, or under study but we should not attach participatory research to a particular tool or method in fact if anything participatory research expands the repertoire of data collection methods as well as knowledge mobilization methods the second issue in participatory research is contextual relevance or contextual specificity or context matters and um, this is something that we are currently looking at in respect of sustainable development goals because we have 17 sdgs they are applicable to barcelona and catalonia and to europe just as they are applicable to delhi and india but in the periphery of barcelona in the hilly region outside the district of barcelona which sdgs are locally relevant and prioritized is the issue likewise in india so when we locally look at local context and prioritize local sdg then that requires local knowledge and this is where professionally trained researchers universities and academics can partner with local communities to study locally prioritized sdg and to develop local knowledge for local solutions because context matters the third uh, uh, point that i want to raise in this is linked to this previous one that in today's context while participatory research and uh, the methodology used by science shops and public engagement has become more prevalent in the world of academia it is still the world of practice where its use and relevance is found uh, there are examples where even in natural sciences people have begun to use this approach and this methodology to engage local communities but those examples are fewer and far between finally uh, is a very big question of research capacity what capacity do participatory researchers need uh, under unesco chair we did a study two years ago which is published and in open source in our website and we realized that there are two parallel streams through which people learn participatory research the most common one is learning by doing those who do it they learn they fumble they improve but they necessarily do not theorize so you don't find in journals or periodicals too many articles written by practitioners though they may be deeply involved in participatory research on the other hand we discovered that in some universities and some courses classroom based training in participatory research happens classroom based training is like this webinar and a full course and reading materials etc etc but those students do not get an opportunity to practice so we have launched a program last year we call it k4c 
knowledge for change initiative which you will find uh, again on our website and k4c's initiative to build capacities of next generation of participatory researchers in a way that integrates the world of practice with the world of academia and this is so because in addition to being a good critical competent researcher a participatory researcher has to be an exceptional facilitator it is only through your facilitation skills that you encourage the community to voice their knowledge to value what they know and to engage with you in the research process listening becomes important interpersonal relations become important building trusting relationships of mutual benefit and support become important these things are not taught in our standard research methodology courses and therefore those of us who have learned it acquired it have done it by chance many adult education facilitators historically had these competencies and those of them like badal who were good researchers also were able to discover and promote this methodology so i want to emphasize that community based participatory research does require investment in building additional and new capacities both in the world of practice and in the world of academia thank you very much i am going to stop here and look forward to your questions in the closing slides oh there is a photo of mine and uh, my cv this is very short i have a long cv you can read wherever you will find and of course a whole set of references but since you have access to slides um, you can uh, find them so thank you very much and let me let me stop now Thank you very much, Rajesh, for this very interesting presentation, combining both theory and also this case study that illustrated very well what we are talking about. Now we will move on to the questions and answers section of this webinar. And uh, I don't know if anybody has a, a question or we can start with a question as well. Okay, I do have a question. I was very interested by what you said on the sustainable development goals and how context matters and that the issue is which ones are prioritized at local level, depending on, on the context. And my question here is what do you think is working and what is not working regarding the implementation of projects to overcome these uh, goals or to attain these goals? And how is participatory research having a role in this path? Thank you. Um, let me give you a concrete example from the eastern region of uh, India, where we have been partnering with a policy making institution in the state of Chhattisgarh, it is called. You will find some reading on our websites later. And uh, the policy making body and uh, a very uh, famous university, its Center for Women's Studies and uh, local indigenous uh, tribal communities. This state has a large number of indigenous communities. And the, the policy making body was interested in looking at the sustainable development goal number five on, on gender equality. And the institute and our colleagues together um, started doing some initial engagement and exploration it so transpires that the goals are interrelated so women's health which may be goal number three and women goal number five but they interact so 
when you look at indigenous communities the tribal communities particularly in that particular specific district then their women's empowerment and women's health were very closely interrelated but policy makers had separate schemes for health and separate schemes for women so they needed to form this figure out how in partnership with the local community the two departments of government health and gender department can actually work together so this was this is a and this is ongoing this process is going on now for last 2 uh, 3 months and it is expanding in other communities um, but there is a big problem here um, the problem is twofold first problem emanates from uh, the academia the people who are working in center for women studies they are all social science people none of them is health person so because they are not health they don't see the problem in health framework so their conceptual and theoretical framework obstruct learning from reality likewise the two parallel government departments one focusing on women and another focusing on health they are also vertical silos and they don't talk to each other though the lives of women are integrated their empowerment and their health are linked so this bottom up participatory research tries to though the entry point was sdg 5 it moved into sdg 3 and it is now pushing both the academic team and the government policy making group to figure out how to respond to this new knowledge that has been discovered because unless they respond to it they will not be able to achieve adequately uh, both the sustainable development goals for this group of tribal community so this is one example of that thank you very much very interesting and at global level how far do you think participatory research is being used as a, an approach to attaining these goals um not much very very little um you have seen um, recently uh, my unesco co chair dr bad hall was at a conference in kuala lumpur of the international association of universities where we launched a big tent declaration uh, guni and others were part of it living knowledge network uh, where we are appealing uh, to higher education institutions to engage with sdgs locally what is happening to academic input in respect of sdgs is that it is currently being used in two ways one is in framing the macro strategy so broad uh, globalized generalized framing of strategy based on specialized knowledge you know so for example uh, you know you, you take take the issue of um, equity in education or girls education now you can frame it and say it's good it's important but where it is not happening the factors may not necessarily be the same the factors in west africa may not be the same as in eastern india so you need to apply it locally second place where academic wisdom and knowledge is currently being used is in developing monitoring indicators and frameworks and collecting data at that level so again that is a macro enterprise it is at national level indicators framework has been developed by different experts but we know from participatory evaluation and monitoring methodologies that if you don't believe in monitoring you will not use the data you are collecting again monitoring has to be brought down to the local level for it to be meaningful to improve progress so uh, i think at a global level and even in india i only gave you 
an exceptional example. Uh, it is not a very common thing as yet where academic institutions are engaging in local solutions for SDGs. Okay, thank you. We have a question just raised in the chat by Ishen uh, from Tunis. Uh, he asked if uh, participatory research means multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary research since it pushed to a more systemic and global vision. So, does participatory research means multidisciplinary research? If you if you look at the the use of participatory research over the last four decades, gradually it is becoming multidisciplinary. In recent years, we have seen examples of disciplines of engineering and sciences working together with social sciences to use this methodology, for example, in finding solutions to urban habitation. Now, we have an interesting situation in India where uh, sanitation issues are on the government's agenda. But in urban areas, their density of population is very high. Without bringing in engineering solutions, you cannot actually provide the sustainable solution to sanitation problem in many urban locations. So engineering, public administration, uh, political science, sociology, and information technology people in some locations are beginning to do some research when the issue is one of uh, safe and livable urban habitation. Um, but the, the, the methodology, because it links to the priorities and aspirations of local community, participatory research methodology must learn to operate in a multidisciplinary fashion. It still does not adequately because our disciplines are organized in a separate way and each discipline is associated with its own preferred research method as well. So sociologists do surveys and archaeologists do drawings and um, you know anthropologists do observation etc cetera, etc cetera. but the lives of people and if we take communities and their problems as a starting point since they are organically integrated the research tools research methods and research frameworks would also have to be organically integrated thank you very much is there any other question Uh, and Giovanna, I was going to write, but maybe I can just ask the question directly. So one of the big issues in participatory research is also to measure the impact on society and uh, how far local communities can be satisfied in participating to the research process. Do you have any idea? or any suggestions about this issue? Well, I think it's a, it's a very good question. The, the use of participatory research for impact assessment has been carried out in the field of international development for more than two decades. In PRIA, we have uh, a number of uh, training programs and methodologies and tools on participatory evaluation. What it means is that the impact, what impact to assess, how to define those indicators, and how to collect data on those indicators is a process of research which is co-carried forward between professionally trained people and communities themselves. So, if it is a participatory research project over a period of 
three, four years, then a framework for assessing its impact should be developed right in the beginning and in partnership and recording of changes that happen. The participatory research methodology actually encourages changes happening while research is taking place. It does not wait for the research findings to be published in public domain. It, it does not separate between the producers of knowledge and the users of knowledge. So it is important, therefore, to build in an impact assessment framework right from the beginning in a participatory research project and to involve different stakeholders in that impact assessment because the impact on different ones of them will be very different. And all of that impact is important to collect and measure. I'm asking if any of our so you can see the chat. Chat. Chat has all the questions. Oh, yeah. Oh, hold on, hold on. Let me let me go to the chat. Where is the chat? There is a question. So we have. Let me. I have just entered the question. Wait, 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 wait. Ah, okay. So, Rajesh, if you want, uh, we can read it uh, for you. Wait, yeah, 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 yeah. Please read one or two, whichever. So Pooja has uh, just uh, asked uh, another question, which is uh, with a short introduction as well. And she says that uh, participatory research has been there for a considerable amount of time now, and it seems to be evolving further. So when you talk about its contemporary relevance, does that also somewhere refer to more contemporized methods? Can you name some? Oh, very good question. Very good question. I'm so glad you reminded me. I can tell you stories about the use of digital technology in participatory research, which did not exist, as you know, seven, eight years ago. So in one of our programs in a, in a city, we wanted to work with informal urban settlements, the poorer communities, to get access to basic sanitation and water services. So we approached the municipality and we looked at the data that municipality had. And the municipality said, well, there are 65 informal settlements in this city. And this is the population. And this is where they are located on the map. So we said, OK, let us find out. So our team of researchers, Priya's team of researchers, first mapped the whole city and we discovered many more settlements than what the municipality's database showed. But we did not have the capacity or the, um, or the time to be able to map all of them. So we started identifying local young people who were savvy on the mobile but not in research and we trained them using mobile as a basis for data collection to map households and settlements. And within a period of three, four months, we discovered double the number of informal settlements and we presented it to the municipality. Those researchers also um, GPS tagged the data and uh, they uh, you know, walked confidently into the office of the municipal commissioner and they said, if you open your GPS map, you will find our communities as well. So this is the example of use of a very contemporary methodology um, uh, that, uh, that uh, is, is, is being used here. Um, the, the use of digital technology and mobile technology um, is becoming uh, increasingly uh, popular in some parts 
like India and some places in other countries. Okay. We have another question from Bolivia, uh, from Claire from Bolivia. She asked if, uh, so she says, action is time consuming. So how do you fit the timetable of academy and of <laughs> that needs time to implement action based on the research fundings? Good question. Very good question. It's a perpetual dilemma. The dilemma is that uh, we all operate in a project framework and projects have a beginning and an end. Now, even when the science shops use students to do research sometimes based on communities questions or problems, they students also have limited life as a student and they graduate and go away. So uh, we have done a as UNESCO chair a study which is also on our website called community university research partnerships and among the various findings one important finding is that academia based researchers need to find bridge builders or intermediaries who continue to relate to the community even after the project is over or even after the students have graduated. So typically uh, in many places, these are either a civil society organization or a local government or a, a small business council or a, a school which continues to relate to the local community. And in fact, having such bridge builders or enablers or intermediaries or facilitators actually also helps to build quick rapport and partnership at the start of the project. Because if you walk in cold in a community, it may take you half your project time just to build partnership and frame research question. So you need that. And we have discovered this through this global study that the most successful enduring and sustainable participatory research efforts are those where such in intermediaries or such enablers or facilitators have been strengthened and created and are active. Then the research cycle with sharing of knowledge, sharing of results is over and the students can graduate. If they find a job in London, they go away. If they still hang around in the locality, they can continue to support the community, but it does not become obligatory. And also there is a mechanism which supports the action which follows. Like the case of Bolivia that I heard briefly, that if, if the community makes demands on the policy makers, and if policy makers get pissed off as normally happens everywhere, then they may um, ignore the community afterwards when the researchers are born, or they may sometimes even harass the community. Then who, who will stand up with them? Um, uh, so, so having strong intermediary partnerships, in some locations, trade unions perform this role. In some locations, cooperatives perform this role. So you have to think about who are the potential intermediaries with which a university or a research institute could partner. Uh, there are also strong community-based organizations, you know, women's group or women's self-help group or a youth group, and they can become your partners, then they can support the action, which obviously takes more time and may go beyond the project cycle. Okay. So we have another question. So thank you all the participants for this vivid uh, debate that we are having now. So the next question uh, is uh, revolving around the ethical concerns of participatory research. Uh, she asked if what are the ways in which participatory research ensures ethics in research compared to other methods? There's another question with that right under it. Uh, there is another question under that. Um, can you read that also? Which one? 
The first one, what are the ethical concerns of participatory research? That I have heard. Um, and the second one is, what are the ways in which participatory research ensures ethics in research compared to research methods? Okay, good. Let me, let me just respond to this. There are further questions beyond the webinar. I'm happy to respond in writing later on. Um, there are three, three steps or three, um, three requisite requirements in participatory research for addressing the ethical uh, issues. The first starts at the stage of building the initial partnership to frame the research question. Openness, frankness, and uh, willingness to explain why external researchers are coming to that community to do research is a very important starting point. If you are trying to dupe or manipulate the community to get involved in the research, sooner you will be found out and your analysis will be suspect. So let's be straight. If you have received some funding, say we have received funding from such and such place, this is our department, this is our expertise, this is why we are interested in research, are you interested in research, do you face similar questions, we can work together, we can develop questions together, my questions are also important, yours are also important, etc. etc. Investing time in it, that initial exploration with openness uh, and uh, authenticity is the first place where um, ethics have to be uh, addressed. The second uh, uh, step where ethical consideration become important is uh, analysis. And analysis typically what happens is that, as I mentioned, while community is actively involved in data collection, analysis uh, tends to be taken forward mostly by formally trained researchers. What we try to promote is to say that this is the data we have found. Let us do separate analysis first. Let community do its own analysis and let us do our own analysis and then we will bring the two analysis to interact with each other. Why it is important is because our conceptual frameworks, our theoretical constructs help us to analyze. And many a times we are not familiar with or even understand the concepts that community uses. So if we do not rush the analysis part, I think uh, that's the second stage because Otherwise, the conclusions we draw are linked to our conceptual framework and give strength to our theories, but not necessarily owned by the community and its concepts. And the third stage is where sharing of knowledge, the, the fundamental principle is who controls the use of that knowledge, who benefits from it um, in participatory research, while we use multiple methods of uh, sharing results, uh, including uh, arts-based methods or popular methods or media methods, um, uh, obviously, if formal uh, researchers are involved, they will publish an article, they will publish a journal article, a book, or go and present it in a conference. We, we encourage the teams to be authentic about it, to talk that this will happen, to acknowledge respectfully the contribution that people have made in the community, to acknowledge that knowledge is not owned by us, but is shared, and as uh, RRI framework encourages, to go to open source so that uh, if community members want to access it, they don't have to pay for it either. In this, uh, I have seen many examples where researchers carry along with them uh, community leaders or community spokespersons 
in uh, research conferences and uh, they also uh, talk about it of course there are uh, linguistic and other financial issues in it but uh, it is possible it is possible to uh, just as a researcher accompanies the local community in a press conference where data is being shared a local community spokesperson can accompany researcher in a international research conference either and uh, this uh, if we are sensitive to this we will make provisions for this in the planning of the research program or the project from the beginning excellent i think there is another question by also by milania uh, which says what's the potential of policy being more people centered if participatory research is used as a dominant methodology in developmental interventions now questions have become increasingly complex <laughs> uh, uh, well look you know the, the 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 most important thing i think which needs to happen is for the world of academia to publicly acknowledge and continue to acknowledge the value of local indigenous and practitioner knowledge the more that happens the more the next generation of students going through academia begin to understand it the easier it will be for use of yeah, an improvisation as well of participatory research methodology in the absence of that acknowledgement if expertise is only linked to professional qualification then there is no reason to co construct knowledge so that is something that will only happen when leaders of academia and leaders of research domain uh, publicly increasingly acknowledge that other forms of knowledge also exist what we need is a way to synergize and link them together and for local actions for local transformation local knowledge needs to be the driving force thank you i think louis harwick uh, has sent a private message saying that he would like to to talk so please louis the floor is yours Has left. <laughs> oh, Louis has left, so that has been a problem, I guess, with her computer. Okay, so we can then move on to one last question because we need to start closing the session, but yeah. we'll have a last question by Ishan asking if participatory research is possible in fundamental research and how to involve the community for fundamental research that's a very good question as well so rajesh the floor is yours well thank you um, as i said questions are getting increasingly complex <laughs> yes. <good>. uh, <laughs> well you know the, the there are a number of issues on which fundamental research particularly in disciplines like physics and uh, mathematics is carried forward in the labs or in a limited cognitive domain that intellectual advancement is not necessarily linked to use of participatory research but if you look at the way our knowledge of genes is now being put to use or if you look at the way our knowledge of nuclear physics was put to use in the manhattan project that bombed japan to end the world war 2 and none other than professor einstein was involved was 
involved in the Manhattan Project. It raises the question about control and use of that knowledge. And there are ethical issues uh, which are important to be raised even at the stage where new knowledge is being funded and produced. And uh, you are all familiar with the contestation going on in many parts of the world around GM food and, uh, and, and now with the gene splicing at the time uh, uh, or robotics um, or uh, artificial intelligence um, if uh, we will only have robots do all the work who will massage my legs and, uh, and uh, what will I do otherwise and uh, so there are there are important questions which remain unexplored or even not even discussed because the world of fundamental research in all our countries and societies is a very secretive limited world. The science uh, budget of government of India applied to fundamental research is not presented to our democratic parliament. There are no more than 10 scientists competent, capable, visionary, etc., etc., who determine where future investment in science should happen. And uh, I believe that this needs greater public debate, public discourse, because once it is, it is normally said, oh, I have invented a knife. Uh, I didn't mean you to use it to cut somebody's throat. It's too bad you cut so many throats. But this is more complex than just the discovery of life. Uh, this, is, this is about having a body of knowledge which significantly and substantially for generations can impact the lives of people and, and vegetations as we know on this planet. So there are serious ethical questions. I am not in favor of saying they should use participatory research methodology, but I am certainly one of those who believe that choices of research questions, even by high science, must be in public domain, deliberated and discussed. Uh, there is, a, uh, you know, there's a very fascinating book on um, NASA space scientists. If any one of you is interested, lay your hands on. It's called Subjective Side of Science. And it is at least 35, 40 years old. And Subjective Side of Science describes how NASA scientists were actually making choices of what technology to develop based on deep subjectivity and not on some objective rational consideration. So, if choice of new research questions is, uh, is to be made with investment largely from public sources, then I think uh, it's not as participatory research, but it is an overlap between the domain of uh, RRI and participatory research in, in making science accountable to society. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. So we have uh, uh, prepared an evaluation questionnaire also for all the participants, just to give your opinions on the webinar and also to suggest new topics for new uh, new webinars. Thank you very much, Rajesh, for this very very interesting uh, call, this interesting webinar, these examples, and. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing all this wisdom <laughs> with, with us as well. And also to thank, I want also to thank the ICE Global team, uh, Irene, who has helped us with the technical part and also with the GoToMeeting uh, platform that we are using and which works fine as well. So uh, thank you very much to all of you for having joined us uh, today. And please fill in these questionnaires so that we can improve for next uh, webinars. And I, I've read some, peop some people asking for the slides. I don't know if uh, Rajesh, you, uh, you want to share the slides with the participants of the webinar. 
Well, thank you very much. I think you should share the slides, uh, and uh, I am happy to respond to other questions that people may have or link them up to resources. And do share the feedback that you receive on this webinar so that we can improve as well. I want to especially thank Pooja, Sumitra, Sonu, and other colleagues here in Priya who made this webinar possible. And thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I also want to thank everybody, all the participants, Rajesh, your colleagues, and my colleague Josep. So thank you very much to all. And hope to see you very soon. Yeah. Thank you and season's greetings and hope to see you in 2019. Thank you okay. also for you. Yeah, also for you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Merry Christmas. Bye. Merry Christmas. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>